the energy crisis. It's been all over the news in 2022. Surging energy prices. That is truly terrifying. Unaffordable energy bills. The cost of energy has shot up to unprecedented levels and everyone from the Prime Minister on down has been talking about ways to get this under control. If you're new to the channel, my name is Neil and I've been a self-employed architect in the UK since 2009. In my day job, I specialise in altering and extending private homes. And in this video, I want to look at one of the main suggestions out there for how the UK might tackle the energy crisis. Can insulation really reduce energy costs for homeowners? It might seem counterintuitive. Of course insulation will save energy costs. Duh. But I think we are pinning too much hope on insulation, especially when a more effective solution is possible and necessary. Before we go too far, I want to point out that if you can insulate your home, you should do it. But don't assume that what works for you will work for everyone. It turns out that adding insulation isn't as easy as people generally assume. I want you to understand that insulation is not a magic bullet. In the long run, done properly, insulation will be a major benefit. The point of this video is to look at the difference between what might work for the average UK household and what might work for the UK as a whole. I hope I can persuade you these are not always the same. I don't think the UK government can insulate our way out of this problem, and whatever money they might be tempted to throw at this could be better spent elsewhere. Let's start with some numbers. Like everything in our economy, the price of heating our homes is determined by supply and demand. About 80% of UK homes use natural gas boilers for heat, and the price of natural gas is determined by supply and demand on the international market. Demand over the past year has been affected by things like an unusually cold winter in China, and the supply has been impacted by the war in Ukraine. So, if events like this impact the cost of energy in the UK, it stands to reason that whatever we do will have very little impact, because the price is determined by events beyond our control. The same logic applies to the 11% of UK homes heated by electricity, and the 5% of UK homes heated by oil. Prices for those energy sources are determined by international markets as well. The next thing to realise is that building new energy efficient homes in the UK won't solve the problem on its own. The UK has over 28 million households, but we build only 190,000 new homes per year. That's less than 0.7% of the total. It's a drop in the ocean. If you assume that we can build enough energy efficient new homes to replace all the inefficient old ones, at the current rate of construction, you'll be waiting until the year 2164. Then there's the size of the private rental market. At present, that makes up about 20% of all homes in the UK. So if we want to reduce energy costs for every UK household, we have to persuade all the landlords in the country to insulate their properties. Given the housing crisis keeps driving up rent, I just don't see the incentive for landlords to spend money to help their tenants save money. Given that some landlords can't be bothered to keep their properties in a fit state for human habitation, this will be a major stumbling block to any government wanting to insulate the UK out of the energy crisis. If we really want to use insulation to reduce energy costs, we need to work out where to spend the money. Not all homes will need the same amount of insulation, and it won't be feasible to insulate every building to the same level. Let me show you what I mean. There are 28.1 million households in the UK, made up of a mixture of ages and types. I used data from the BRE Trust to create this graph, showing the type and number of homes in the UK. I've put a link to the source data in the description. Then there's the age profile of UK housing. I made this chart from the same source data. Over 60% of the UK housing stock dates from the 20th century, built between 1919 and 1990. But how inefficient are these homes really? How much better insulated is a modern home compared to a Victorian or Georgian property? A modern home, built over the last 30 years or so, had to insulate its walls, floor and roof. The amount of insulation required will vary depending on the type used and the method of construction employed, but we measure the heat loss using something called a U-value. It's like golf, the lower the number, the better the score. I work in Scotland and under our regulations, an external wall can't have a value higher than 0.22. This means the wall must lose no more than 0.22 watts of heat per square meter per hour per degree of temperature difference between the inside and outside. That is a mouthful and it might be a bit confusing, so here are three examples to help you get your head around it. This is a U-value calculation for a modern cavity wall with insulation partially filling the cavity and more insulation inside the wall. You can see each layer of the wall listed individually, its thickness and the thermal resistance that provides. This wall meets today's U-value standard. This is the same wall with the insulation removed. This is what a lot of 20th century homes are built like, cavity walls with no insulation. Their U-value is 0.79, 
that is three and a half times less efficient than a modern home. This is what an older stone building would achieve, a U-value of 1.4, which is over six times less efficient than a modern home. It also shows that even an uninsulated cavity wall is significantly more efficient than a solid wall. This should give you some idea of what it costs to heat older buildings. The cost will be multiples of the energy bill for a modern home. Only homes built since 1990 will have reasonably efficient insulation as standard. So if we want to narrow the problem area down and focus any government effort where it will have maximum effect, we can eliminate all homes built in the past three decades. This leaves just 23.6 million homes to worry about. But we should also take into account that many properties have been upgraded since they were built. Lots of people have already insulated older buildings in the UK. This chart from the Office of National Statistics shows the median energy rating score for properties in England and Wales by age. You can see that while older buildings are less efficient, on average they are not three to six times less efficient. This research shows that many older buildings have already been upgraded over time. And this is the big problem. Even if money were no object and the UK government could grant billions to homeowners to insulate their properties, a huge number of our buildings just can't be brought up to anything like a modern standard. We can make improvements, yes, but we quickly run into practical problems. Many older buildings have solid floors, so insulating them would require digging them up. It's achievable, but it's expensive. This is what it looks like in practice from one of my own projects. What do we do with buildings which have solid walls, no cavity? It is possible to add external insulation, but that makes the building look like it's on steroids and often isn't acceptable if the property is in a conservation area, as many old buildings are. External insulation isn't always practical on terraced properties or tenement flats either, which we now know make up a huge proportion of the UK housing stock. What happens if one of the properties in the row or block decides not to go ahead with external insulation? Will that negatively impact all its neighbours? Then there's the spectre of Grenfell Tower, Will people actually want insulation on the outside of their homes after that tragedy? Cavity wall insulation might work if your home has a cavity, but it has a very mixed reputation, often caused by unscrupulous installers. Adding insulation to the inside of an old building is possible, but not usually acceptable if the building is listed and has period features. It will also reduce the amount of space inside the property. If you stick a 100mm dense insulation board on the inside face of your external walls, you have to consider moving the skirting boards, door surrounds, plug sockets, and radiators. It will require several tradespeople, lots of time and money, and at the end of it, your home will be physically smaller. The walls are literally closing in, like on this project of mine. Insulating an attic is perhaps the easiest task in most properties, but what happens if the attic is already inhabited? You then have to strip all the internal linings and insulate between the rafters. This is every bit as disruptive and expensive as insulating inside the external walls. At a certain point in time, most homeowners do a quick cost to benefit calculation and decide it's just not worth it. They might do as much as they can within reason, and accept that owning an older property always entails higher heating bills. Why pay 10, 15, 20,000 pounds to have your home torn apart just to save a grand or two per year? It makes no sense. The graph from the Office of National Statistics and my U-value calculation appears to back this up. People have been insulating older properties, but only as far as is practical. And I should say that even when it is affordable to insulate an older property, no matter what method is used, the building needs to take damp and ventilation into account. All homes have moisture in them from cooking, showering, cleaning, and people just walking around breathing. In a poorly insulated building, all that moisture in the air condenses on the walls, floor, and ceiling. But in most buildings, the surface area is so large that moisture is very thinly distributed, you don't notice it. If an older building has part of its fabric insulated, however, say the attic or some of the external walls, that reduces the amount of cold surface inside the building which saves you money on your heating bill, but it also means the moisture in the air can now condense on a smaller area. Suddenly, there's a lot of damp on the floor or around the windows, and this can lead to mold, fungus, and rotting timbers. Any increase in insulation requires an increase in ventilation as well, which can be self-defeating. The air flowing through the house carries away the moisture, but it also carries away the heat. It is possible to install heat recovery ventilation systems, which solve this problem, but that's more money, and we are back to where we started, wondering, whether this is actually worth it. Any government intervention to fund insulation in UK homes will run up against people using their own common sense. It will also fall foul of unscrupulous installers 
seeing this as a money-making opportunity, eventually there will be horror stories in the media and people like me saying, I told you so. So what would I do if it were up to me? What kind of solution would make more financial sense for the UK as a whole? Well, I would start with supply and demand. Installation is all about the demand side of the equation, and I think the solution is on the supply side. The entire problem boils down to the cost of heating our homes. So rather than worrying about the cost of heat lost in poorly insulated buildings, we need a system that provides cheap energy to heat properties in the UK. It seems to me we already have this in the form of renewable electricity. We produce almost 38% of our electricity from renewables this year, chiefly from wind turbines, and that share is growing every year. Successive UK governments have poured billions into subsidising the wind generating industries. 285 million this year alone. Now don't get me wrong, I think this is a great thing. I want to see an energy transition. But we now have a ludicrous situation where the cost of renewable electricity is determined by the price of gas. Because gas generates the base load and is always ready all the time, whereas wind is intermittent, we have a system designed to incentivize gas generators by guaranteeing it gets the highest price and no other method of electricity generation can undercut it. Wind power is so cheap, its cost is marginal, but it is being charged to consumers at the same price as electricity made from natural gas. I can't be the only person who thinks this is crazy. I have looked into it, and I understand the need to have a market pricing mechanism that encourages generators to provide electricity when we need it. But given how much taxpayer money has been poured into renewables over the past decade, it seems UK households get all the downsides of capitalism and none of the upsides of socialism. Smarter people than me have been applying themselves to this problem, and perhaps we need a second market for electricity, produced exclusively by renewables and used to heat our homes. It's not as far-fetched as it sounds. Companies like Tepio have electric central heating systems which directly replace gas boilers and run on off-peak electric tariffs. This isn't a paid advert, by the way. The beauty of the Tepio product is that it stores heat until you need it, so it can charge up overnight. With smart meters and a bit of clever thinking, it ought to be possible to produce and sell cheap electricity for this purpose. For this to work, we need to redesign the electricity marketplace so that off-peak wind power can be sold at its true market cost, not at a rate determined by the international gas market. If we can reduce the cost of heating our homes, then spending money tearing them apart to insulate them won't be necessary. If the heat is generated by zero carbon renewables, we won't need to worry about the planet either. If you know anyone who is working on this problem, let me know about it in the comments. I would love to interview them on the channel. Like I said at the beginning, don't let this put you off insulating your home. It's always worthwhile. It just might not be the perfect solution for everyone. If you enjoyed this video, please subscribe. I make new content every week.